Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Versus Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Ed Brisson boards the mothership. He's the all-star writer of Batman Incorporated, the upcoming Brave and the Bold. Come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Brisson. Thank you so much for coming to the Versus Stars podcast. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute honor, sir. You're a fabulous writer. It's good to have you on the show. Well, thanks a lot. So I always start off with the question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of comics and who are your earliest influences? So my love of comics, I think, uh, sort of comes, I feel like every 80s kid has a similar origin story in that they were in the hospital at some point and the grandparent or a relative dropped off a stack of comics. Uh, mine is not a whole lot different. Uh, <laughs> I think I was in the, I was in and out of hospital a lot when I was a kid, um, but I think the time where I, I got hooked on comics was when I had to have uh, my tonsils removed. I was in the hospital for I think two or three days. I, they were doing something else. I can't remember what it is. Something to do with my ears. Um, yeah, just from there, uh, you know, I had a stack of comics. So I couldn't even tell you what was in the stack to be honest. Uh, lots of Batman. I do know that there was some Batman there. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, my mom was a uh, a big reader so we would go to the used bookstore almost every weekend and uh, they had a 10 cent bin by the front door and i would just plunk down there and spend most of my allowance on 10 cent comics and then when i started out it was a lot of uh peter porker the spectacular spider ham um spider-man i was a big fan of spider-man uh, i think there was a, a captain america run that i was really into uh, even as a kid, I was pretty morbid, and there was a, there's a three issue run where um, I believe it's uh, is it Scourge or Sin Eater. I can't believe I'm forgetting now, but uh, someone goes and he shoots up the bar with no name and kills oh. about like you know like a hundred villains over the course of three issues. And I used to have the Marvel Universe, so I was really big into collecting Marvel Universe issues, and I remember that issue just coming up constantly. Uh, those issues coming up constantly in the in the Marvel Universe uh, deceased issues. And so I, I remember those were the first issues that I was really obsessed with finding. And it took me, I think, about a year to track those Captain Americas down. But yeah, and then as Daredevil was a big one for me, early X-Men, Punisher, uh, and Batman, of course. Mm. So it's, what was it about comic books that when you got into them, they just got into your blood? Um, you know what? I'm not sure. I Like at that point in my life, I was already a big reader. You know, I, I started reading uh, novels and such at a pretty young age. And um, I always just had an interest in art as well. So I think it was just the merging of those two things, you know, storytelling with art. That really spoke to me. Uh, and originally, when I was younger, I wanted to be, a, I wanted to grow up to be a comic book artist. I didn't have a whole lot of interest in becoming a comic book writer. So it was really their art that, that sort of drew me in. And uh, you asked about influences. So uh, some of my earliest influences, I think comic-wise, uh, the series that hit me the hardest when I was younger was... Uh, Spider-Man's Craven's Last Hunt. I think that was a very sort of uh, uh, that that comic. I, I, I can point back to a lot of like sort of my interests in, in seeing how they were really uh, at the forefront in that series. And then later on, um, Todd McFarlane was a huge, huge mm. influence for me. Uh, you know, he was an incredible artist, but also uh, with me being Canadian. Uh, there weren't a ton of Canadian comic book creators uh, back then. Uh, I think I wasn't, for some reason, aware when I was younger that John Byrne was also Canadian. Um, but Todd McFarlane was sort of the the guy for me. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I definitely wanted to be Todd McFarlane. When I was uh, starting out uh, trying to draw comics, I would trace a lot of Todd McFarlane stuff. Uh, so he was a, he was a huge, huge uh, early influence. Uh, in childhood, uh, and then later Eric Larson was uh, another big one. Um, you know, it, it's fantastic when certain names get repeated by people. It always seems like the greats have a long list of people who want to be them. You know, who who are influenced by them. Like I said, I hear McFarlane a lot. I, um, the first time I think uh, Adi Matiz, uh, but that's such a great story. And uh, people say Neil Gaiman. It, it's it's amazing the the kind of coattails um, you can get when you become a great writer. And 
it, do you often think about the people who are going to be on your coattails thinking i want to be the next ed brisson no nah, never i, I never <laughs> can, i cannot imagine a world where there's someone out there saying i want to be the next ed brisson uh so no i i don't <laughs> that, that, that's funny because like i said you you are one of the big writers right now of your of your generation and when you're um writing something like batman incorporated you also have to carry the mythology of a character who is the legendary character of multiple generations so how do you kind of mentally prepare to write a character with at, at, at that level or at least within a universe of that level so i was kind of lucky in that uh you know with batman incorporated batman hands off the reins to ghostmaker um to run the run the group so batman is only in it for a little bit um i've had a chance in the past to write batman a little bit and it's uh it's always incredibly intimidating because uh, because he's such a rich history, and he's one of those characters that has such a uh, an incredible lineage of uh, top tier writers and artists uh, having worked uh, with the character, and so it is always incredibly intimidating. And then, of course, coming to Batman Incorporated, which is uh, you know really a a Grant Morrison thing. I, I think Grant Morrison is the only one who's written sort of Batman Incorporated as mm. a, a series. And when I say I think I know, he's the only one. Uh, so the, it is a, quite a bit of pressure, uh, but that was then balanced by the fact that, you know, uh, Ghostmaker is a fairly new character. Uh, Clown Hunter, who is his uh, his Robin, I guess, if, you're, if he's a Batman proxy, is a, quite a new character. And so there is not a ton of... Uh, sort of continuity baggage that goes along with them. So it, it, it is easier to sort of sort of carve out something that feels newer, fresher, and to sort of forge my own path without having to necessarily uh, worry about uh, you know, having this, this um, the prestigious, you know, uh, task of, of, of making sure that Batman is done well and at the right, which is not to say I'm not trying to do Ghostmaker and, and, and Clown Hunter, right? So that's definitely always my goal, but it, it, it's a little bit less pressure. Mm. <laughs> so a, a, a book like Batman Incorporated has a, a relatively massive cast. At least it, 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 it seems much larger than even a standard team of like maybe four or five characters. There's, there's a lot going on in this book, a lot of characters. How do you make sure each one has a voice distinct enough that just reading the dialogue, you know it's them? Yeah, it's a really tough challenge, I'll, I'll be honest, because we have, I think there's... Uh, I should have counted before, I know, but I believe there's eight members, uh, and it is, it's tough. It's something I always struggle with uh, when I'm writing. Um, what I tend to do is I'll tend to write um, like a, a first and second draft versions, and then go back and sort of try and fine tune their voices so that you know if they're speaking from off panel, um, you you might know who it is. It's not that, and that's not always possible. But, uh, you know, uh, but it is something I strive for to, to make sure that everyone's sensing me. Everyone's got their own sort of thing going on, their own baggage, their own, uh, you know, way of speaking or, or what have you, their own uh, personality. And yeah, it's tough, but it's really just uh, through revising, just making sure I keep in, in mind who the characters are, where they come from, what their, what their lineage is, what their history is. Uh, and just trying to make sure that they always stay true to it uh, and just doing several drafts. And I'll also um, constantly go back and reread older material, even if I've read it five or six times already, like uh, books where they've already appeared and even my earlier issues, just to make sure that everything is true to that character. So just for our would-be writers who are watching the show and wanting to, to, be, uh, to be like you're writing a book like this, when, when you think about like the verbal cadence of a character, let's say like Ghostmaker or like I said, Phantom One or whatever, you're just trying to make their distinct voice. What are you looking for? Are you looking for like certain like voice, verbal cadence? You're looking for just a way, a tone. Like when did you know you had the right dialogue for so that it's not, guy? It's not always just cadence, but like just how they might address the situation. You know, like Ghostmaker is sort of no nonsense for the mm. most part. He's, you know, he's an asshole. And he doesn't really sort of sugarcoat anything. So it's, he's going to be more direct, say, than someone like uh, Grey Wolf, who's like a newer character, who is a bit more, 
uh, caring. He's a bit more like sort of eyes wide and this is all new to him. So he's, he's more excited about stuff. So that's going to be reflected in the way that he's talking. Um, and not necessarily always cadence, but the way, you know, the way that he is going to approach a situation. Whereas uh, Ghost, uh, not Ghost Mayor, Clown Hunter is a little bit more uh, eager, uh, angrier all the time without necessarily being a, a like he could be a little prick, but he's he's just eager to get things done right. And I think we, you know, in the next couple of issues, we're going to get to see a little bit more uh, Clown Hunter sort of how he's kind of caught between two worlds, uh, which I think is really sort of interesting, uh, uh, interesting direction that we're taking the character. But it's more it's more than just a cadence, more than just like tossing in you know, uh, British idioms for, for night or whatever. It's it's more in the way that they approach a situation, more the way that they view the world and then reflecting that in the dialogue. Uh, and I, I do think the, the, the runaway character in the book so far is Ghostmaker. He, you do such a good job with him. Um, and I think he's such a strong character and he's it, it very much like, like all good character that live in the bat universe. He's sort of a reflection of Batman. He's Batman. If um, a willingness to kill characters of uh, villains, so is this difference one of philosophy or is it just lack of empathy? Where wh- where does he stand in that fulfills that difference from Batman? It's both. It's both. It's the philosophy is just literally if you kill a criminal, they can't commit a crime again. Uh, Ghostmaker is a diagnosed psychopath, so he has very little empathy for anyone. Uh, so it's really just a, a meeting of those two things. Um, for Batman Incorporated, the one. Um, promise he's had to make to Batman in order, you know, the one thing he promised when he took over the incorporated is that he wouldn't kill. So a lot of the series, especially, uh, you know, we see it a bit in the first arc, but we're going to really see it in the second and the third arc is really Ghostmaker hitting up against this like uh, idea that he could deal with the situation immediately. Right. You know, he can, he can deal with it uh, and end you know, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's 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 this moment where he could almost end all crime in Gotham, uh, but because of this promise of Batman, he has to find other solutions, and uh, it's a thing that is a constant source of frustration uh, for him. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the the question about Ghostmaker is the idea of sustainability in this philosophy and and how he's not killed because once again, the reason why usually a hero kills a villain is so the, the villain doesn't get up the next day and kill somebody else, uh, an innocent, yes. a civilian. As long as he's not killing somebody, eventually that's going to have to come around again, where someone that he didn't kill is now taking out somebody else. How long can he sit through that with and keep it sustainable before he decides, you know what, I need to do this again? You know what? And that's actually a big part of uh, our third arc. So, but like, <laughs> it's definitely a thing that we're addressing. It's a thing uh, that he is he's rubbing up against really hard at that point because uh, – he, I, it's not a philosophy he buys into. He's only doing this as a promise to Bruce. And, uh, you know, he, he's starting to uh, question the, the validity of the approach and the uh, whether or not he's going to hold up the, the promise. So how concerned is Batman that Ghostmaker can keep this promise? Because, well, and, and also someone like Batman who preps for everything, is he already prepared to not take out Ghostmaker if he can hold on to a promise like this? So Batman is not like uh, not really going to enter into it for a little while. And so, you know, Batman is a little bit off the board for us right now. Uh, but yeah, you know, he's Batman. He, he's prepared to have to throw down uh, over this sort of, uh, uh, I guess, moral battleground of his. Uh, so it, it is a thing that we'll definitely see at some point. And the other interesting is that, as you said, Ghostmaker being a psychopath, He's the leader of a team, which is unusual for a psychopath to choose to be under the care of, to have other people under his care, as it were. So as far as that goes, how does that affect his ability to be a leader? And as someone who's following him, do they know he's like this, like a sort of psychopath? And how is it easy for him to follow direction of someone who they know is this kind of, or this kind of individual? So they, they're they aware uh, of, of who he is. I think as a leader... He's actually an incredibly effective leader, um, but because he's a psychopath, uh, he is, you know, and again, this is the sort of stuff that we touch on as in the next arc and the, and the third is he, 
isn't above playing some sort of like mind games with the rest of the with the rest of the group. And we're going to see that a bit more going forward. I think he is an effective leader. I think he's just very blunt and he knows sort of what needs to be done. Uh, but now he has this sort of ho- a huge um, moral obstacle in his way that is making it more difficult for him. Uh, so, yeah, I think I, I think he's an effective leader. He's- so his interest in his team, and obviously a good leader wants to keep his team basically safe, or, or at least very much, at least survive. Is he doing it because he sees them as a tool to use, or does he actually have some level of affection for these individuals under his team? I honestly don't think he like. I think we played around with that a little bit in with Phantom One, um, in the first arc at, about whether or not he actually cares, and we it, it's never going to be clear. I think you know there is part of him that understands that every member of the team is just a tool, and that sometimes tools break and need to be replaced. And uh, he's never. I think he's aware enough to not tell the team that, but I believe that <laughs> he believes that. Uh, so, you know, he wants to keep them around as much as it serves a mission. But if uh, if someone dies, then there's, you know, other Bat men incorporated uh, members waiting in the wings. You know, I think that's one of the cool thing about the Bat Incorporated books is that you do have Batman from all over the world on this team from different cultures, you know, different backgrounds. How fun is it to imagine what a Batman's ideals would look like within a drastically different culture and society? Yeah, I think... You know, I think that his sort of main purpose is is sort of universal, right? You know, uh, but the sort of alternate cultural approaches, I think we're, we'll see some of that going forward. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think, like, there's not massive drastic departures from, I think, his, his main sort of tenets, his main beliefs. Uh, there may be little differences here and there, but you know, yeah, I, I, like it, it's, it all is pretty much the same, you know, across the board. So, I know that sounds boring, but, you know, I think no, but... at its core, it's all the same. So in issue five, the reader is told that when Lex Luthor built his Batman program, it was with an eye towards those who experience trauma. And the quote he, you use is, trauma is what makes all good vigilantes. So how accurate do you view that statement? And if trauma makes a good vigilante, then what makes a good hero? So... <laughs> That's a good question. I I don't know if I, I fully believe that. I think that Lex Luthor believes that. And I think that, you know, the evidence on display, uh, especially if you're looking at Batman and all the, the myriad of Robins, uh, they all have that one thing in common, uh, in common. And then we have that with all the, most of the Batman Incorporated um, uh, members. And I think, like, I don't think there's any difference. I think, you know, a hero can be someone who's experienced trauma, but is someone who is able to sort of look past it and try and see uh, the good in society and the, and the good of people, you know, a, a, a hero is more about, you know, I hate to quote like a Superman movie, but it's like, it's about hope, right? It's bringing yeah. hope to people. Whereas a vigilante is more about punishment and, mm-hmm. and eradicating. Um, so one is more like enlightenment. One is more, you know, uh, punishment i guess like to go back to what i just said yeah so that's the main difference for me so is batman incorporated then a bunch of vigilantes or are they going to work towards being a bunch of heroes so i think it's a mix right like i think that each one has um sort of their own ideals but i would say that like night is more of a hero than she would be a vigilante even though she's she's out there knocking heads at night i would say gray wolf even though he has this trauma in his past his his main focus is really sort of protecting his village and protecting people uh i say clown hunter and ghostmaker are definitely uh, vigilantes so you know it's really a mix uh, of the two I, and i think you know uh in the third arc we're going to be pushing a couple of characters to some pretty dark places. So I think that's really going to be tested as to where, where they lie. So as you mentioned, clown hunter, who's I think is really cool. And he came out of the Joker war storyline, just like uh, Ghostmaker uh, did uh, for the most part. Um, so how is clown hunter at a crossroad between the paths of Batman and Ghostmaker's uh, original path? 
like when they were still first fighting you mean like or when oh, they first oh as, as like a like philosophically and like the direction goes oh. is going to take in life how close is he at that cross between do, going batman's route or going what close ghost make originally um was so he's batman? he's really riding that line and that's uh that's one of the big things why batman wanted um uh, Ghostmaker to make this promise not to kill. Is he's supposed to train uh, Clown Hunter? I, you know, it's good. Clown Hunter and Ghostmaker are, are alike in a lot of ways. Um, and I think and I feel like I, I'm copying out by constantly saying this is stuff that we're going to be approaching uh, in the series. But that is a, a big part of uh, Clown Hunter's journey in the in the second and third arc. I think in the second arc we're going to see uh, Clown Hunter really sort of uh, realizing what sort of life he's leaving behind to sort of embark on, on the quest that he's in right now. And the third arc is really going to, you know, test him to see which, which direction he ultimately goes. Um, it, like, but right now he's definitely like a kill happy. Uh, uh, he's much more in Ghostmaker's camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, if they didn't have this sort of promise to Bruce, uh, that they've they've upheld so far, uh, I think that he would be much more of a uh, Ghostmaker, uh, much more aligned with Ghostmaker philosophically. You know, I think it's really cool with like, what we did with Clown Hunter in the first arc, because obviously the arc is uh, Noir, uh, Noir Mentors, and he feels like his journey is symbolic of the point of the story, which is the impact of mentors on their students. And I kind of feel like his um, relationship with Ghostmaker as, as a mentor student is similar to, you know, saying the overall arc you're, you created with the idea of mentors. It was How was he meant to be like a microcosm of the bigger um, situation? What happens when you get rid of these great mentors? So, you know, I think with, with Clown Hunter, it was really just you know, as part of his sort of his own quest, right, to figure out what he wants to be. I think this is really for him exposing his own mentor, which is just Ghostmaker. He's not he's not necessarily going through a series, but it's exposing sort of the cracks in Ghostmaker's philosophy and exposing the sort of problems of this, uh, the sort of lifestyle that they're choosing. And so it it it's kind of what puts him on this on this path that he's going to be heading down in these next couple arcs where you know he's starting to realize what this life is like and, and, and you know what his what 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 his teacher had gone through who he'd, who he'd gone through these things with and whether or not this is really sort of the life for him uh so it's really just uh it's almost like an expose on mentorship for him uh, to, to see where he, where he wants to land you know, I think it's another good line that Coast Maker talks of second chances. So is he return, referring to himself directly, Batman Incorporated, or Phantom One and his team as far as ideas of second chances? Why not all three? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely it's definitely meant to uh, apply to to uh, especially himself and to uh, Phantom One and Phantom One's uh, crew of uh, uh, former Lex Batman. So issue five ends with a cliffhanger. Um, can you get tell our readers a little bit about, about the upcoming threat and where might our listeners see these have seen these villains before? So um, we have at the end of issue five, it's uh, alpaca appears and and sort of issues a threat to the Batman of China. And alpaca, for those who don't know, is Batman of China's sister, and she is sort of a a, a Joker proxy for. Uh, China and, and has battled uh, uh, Batman uh, of China in the past. So where we're leading with this, and I, I, I think it's out in the solicits, but the third arc, so we have the first arc that just ended, and there's a mini arc, which is two issues, and then our third arc, which is a, a five issues, starts at issue eight. Uh, we are starting uh, what's called Joker Incorporated. And so Joker has decided that if Batman gets to have Batman all across the world, then Joker gets to have Jokers all across the world. And so we're about to set off a giant war between Joker Incorporated and Batman Incorporated. Very and cool. So uh, that last page is just sort of a tease into it. We have another tease into it at the end of issue seven, and then we go full bore on it on issue eight. 
That sounds absolutely awesome. So can you tell us a little bit of what we may be seeing with some of the Jokers that could pop up? Are you able to give any hints to that or no? So the only one that is an existing character was Alpaca, who's uh, who's there at the end of issue five. So there are, I believe, five more Jokers. They're all new characters. Uh, one of them is a character who's been mentioned in comics before and, and like once in a panel uh, 11 years ago uh, in a comic. And uh, I just love the name so much. Um, and it, it kind of, the name implies that this character would be a Joker proxy or a Joker-like character. Uh, but other than that, they're all new characters. And um, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty, but uh, Joker is going to be there uh, and is going to sort of, uh, He's going to set the stage at, that will uh, sort of make or break Ghostmaker as a leader and make or break Batman Incorporated. And he's going to sort of force their hands uh, in a way that in order to uh, be victorious, they're going to have to uh, get their... And I'm trying. I'm trying my best not to spoil anything. Oh, no, it, you're anyway. feel free to swear. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not swear. I just, I just don't want to spoil anything. Uh, okay. so I'm, I'm trying to skirt around it a little bit. Uh, no problem. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're allowed to talk about it, but you did mention it, so I'm going to ask. You mentioned the Brave and Bold anthology coming in May. Are you allowed to talk about that or no? I could talk a little bit about it, I think. All right, so what can you... Because Brave and Bold very famously has to do with team-ups. Uh, Batman yeah. tends to be the one of the two that's usually teamed up. Is that going to be true of your story in, in the anthology, or these are different two different characters? And can you mention which ones they are? Uh, so I'm not doing a team up. So the new Brave and the Bold is going to be an anthology book. So there are team ups in it. There's, uh, you know, there'll always be a story involving Batman. But what I am doing is full issue uh, length stories uh, about Stormwatch. So I'll, we'll be launching sort of a Stormwatch series within the Brave and the Bold. And that will feature the um, same team that was in the uh, uh, Wildstorm 30th anniversary um, issue that we did, um, which is uh, some old characters, some new characters. Um, one of the characters who didn't make it through that 30th anniversary issue is obviously being replaced. And so actually we're bringing Phantom One after after Batman Incorporated, Phantom One is actually joining Stormwatch. Oh, very good. Um, which I don't think is a spoiler. He's on the cover. So like, <laughs> hopefully people can piece that together. Um, and yeah, we've got uh, we've got a, a, a pretty excellent uh, several issues plan called Down with the Kings, which is uh, about Stormwatch uh, hunting that uh, you know the Justice League is gone. Uh, they've moved into the Watchtower and taken it over as a new Skywatch. And they are going after enemies of uh, the Justice League, but with a specific purpose in mind. They're after specific weapons that they are going to hopefully uh, use down the line. Um, unlike uh, Batman Incorporated, uh, Stormwatch's philosophy is that the only way to uh, deal with criminals is to uh, to wipe them out, wipe them out. And so uh, it's going to be a very uh, sort of murder heavy book i guess uh but it is again it's a, another thing that they'll sort of brush up against and uh yeah i'm pretty excited i'm working with uh jeff spokes uh, is on art and his, the pages i've seen so far have been absolutely just incredible uh, so i'm very excited to get out there so what if they're in the using the watchtower how much of this set up the bigger storylines when the justice league i assume is eventually going to come back because it's hard to have dc without the justice league eventually is this building up to is it something larger that you can hint at or at least give a wink that it, this, you know, this builds to something? Their whole idea right now is that they're kind of like taking over Justice League's job and the Justice League's headquarters. And uh, what I guess I'll, I'll get into is they just want to make sure that like if the Justice League comes back and comes at them, that they're well equipped to fight back. <laughs> so how is it difficult to incorporate the Wildstorm characters into the DC universe, or do you feel that's like a natural meshing that can, that can happen? I felt it was pretty natural. Like, um, I think, you know, there've already been Wildstorm characters kicking around DC, so it's, it's nothing new. Uh, thankfully we didn't have to get into sort of any multiversal reason why they're, why they're here. They're already here. 
So it's been fairly seamless. Uh, it was interesting trying to come up with, um, uh, you know, team members that were you know, already known as Stormwatch members, bringing in uh, existing characters. And then we created, um, well, if you count Phantom 1, then we've created three characters, two who are on the team. One is like a support staff. Uh, and But it was, it's, fairly simple you know like I, I i wasn't it wasn't something i was worried about it wasn't something that kept me up at night because like i said they were already there um uh, it's easy enough to explain if if a character hasn't sort of been shown uh, in the newer dc stuff why they're here uh, so i didn't really want to get hang up hung up on that i really just wanted to sort of get down to brass tacks and get into the story so is brave and the bold a monthly and are you going to be working on one story for every every month that it comes out so I believe it's monthly, um, and I'm not sure how if I'm allowed to say how many stories I'm working on, but I've got several plans. So we'll just say that uh, for now. But uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, you'll see so much for a while. Very cool, Mr. Brisson. It's been an absolute honor to speak with you, sir. And hopefully, people um, look forward to the next uh, storyline. I think. It's All right. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, you too.